Do you want to learn how you can not just hit your target, but the steps you need if you want to double or triple it? Then this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Mark Danilo. He is the author of Essential Account Planning, and that is exactly what we're diving into today. Now, account planning, it sounds somewhat dry. We all should be doing it. Perhaps we're not doing it as well as what we could do. Mark turns all of this on its head. I promise you there's a ton of value in this episode. Everything that we talk about is available in the show notes over at salesmanpodcast.com. With all that said, let's jump straight in. Mark, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thank you, Will. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you on, mate. Today, we're going to dive into a topic which I think it might not be the most exciting thing that the audience have clicked on on these episodes, but it's probably the thing if you're in a complex B2B sale that's going to earn you more money than anything else. You can give me your thoughts on this in a second, but to, to tee things up, why do we need to strategically plan our accounts in B2B sales rather than what we tend to do or what I've found myself tend to do when I've not planned accounts, which is fighting fires all day, being reactive to things and just selling by the seat of my pants. We, you know, I would say this is actually a very exciting topic, Will, and, and, and I think the reason is because it can make our lives a lot easier. And, and you know, I, I've, I've lived exactly what you're describing, which is, you know, selling by the seat of your pants. And, and uh, I think salespeople inherently love to be out in front of the customer. Uh, they love to sell. They love the action. Uh, what they don't love is they don't love uh, sitting down and planning, strategizing, trying to figure things out. Uh, in a conference room, they'd rather be out uh, in front of the customer. And I think that's one of the things that makes account planning hard. But, you know, one of the lessons that you learn is when you're in those positions, those precarious positions where you're coming up to the end of the quarter, or you're coming up to the end of the year, and you're not at goal, or you're not where you need to be, and you don't have the pipeline that you need to have in order to get there, and you're not quite sure where those next deals are going to come from, <laughs> those are kind of the clarifying times where you go, gosh, I probably should have done a better job planning this out. So uh, I, I think that the point is, if we're planful, we can actually perform a lot better, make our lives a lot easier and a lot better as well. Makes total sense. I know my most stressful periods in sales have been exactly what you just described, probably compounded with I knew I had one account that if I closed it or one deal in the medical device world, if I closed it, it would be a big theater refurbishment. It'd be 15 camera systems going into an NHS trust, whatever it would be. I knew if I closed that one deal, the business would be mine. But I found myself in this scenario many years in, the, in a row of I had this one big deal. My target would be crushed if I hit it, but I wasn't sure if I was ever going to hit it. I didn't have a, a backup plan. There was no, that's probably the best way to describe it. There was no backup plan. To this deal not coming in. So Mark, is the best place to start with this, and this, this is going to sound weird until I kind of fill out this question, but is the best place to start with this at the beginning or the end in that should we suss out how we're going to strategically plan before we start doing it? Or do we need to start with the end in mind and work backwards from what our quota is and then kind of do the account management back from that point? I, I think it's the latter, Will. I, I think it's knowing where you need to go. In fact, when we talk about account planning, we talk about goal setting as one of the big areas that's really important with account planning. You have to know where you're heading, and then you can work backwards from that. So with account planning, what we tend to do is we'll look at the big goal, and, and usually uh, for people that are doing account planning, these are pretty significant size accounts. So they're they're worthy of doing this for because they've got a lot of complexity, a lot of buying points, and you probably have a lot of big dollars attached to them. So by starting with the goal, so say, for example, you needed to, you had a quota of $10 million for next year. So that, that's a pretty sizable goal for most people. How do you get to that goal? Well, the first thing we would do is we would take that $10 million and we would start to flush the lines and identify uh, what we have, first of all, in backlog. So what do we already know about that's in process or maybe is going to renew for next year, perhaps contracts are gonna show up again. And then we start to go through the easy hits, things that we already are aware of in terms of opportunities uh, within the account. And we may be doing this for one account, most people are doing it for several accounts, uh, unless they, they manage just one, they're doing it, for, doing it for several accounts. So if you have that $10 million, what we're trying to do is typically uh, you know, the old adage, if you want to have uh, two and a half or three times 
your pipeline in terms of uh, your goal in your pipeline to ensure that you're going to get there. We do the same thing when we're planning for the account planning. So we'll say, I want to find two and a half or three times that $10 million. So call it $30 million. I want to find $30 million of opportunity at the beginning of the year, even before I start <laughs> the year, I want to find that. And so I'm going to go through the all the audience here, Mark, have just grabbed all of their chest and gone, oh, uh, three times more than what I thought I could get anyway. Well, and, and that's exactly what happens. So we go through the list with the team and we say, okay, let's find $30 million of opportunity. We might find uh, 10 or 12 because that's easy to get. And that's where the creative work starts. That's where we start thinking about how do we find other opportunities? So we start combining elements like, okay, what do we have to offer in terms of product or service? Are there different ways to offer that product or service? Uh, what about buyers or buying points? Are there different buyers within our, within our accounts that we haven't considered? And then we look at partners. A lot of times we don't consider that. Partners, which might be alliances, resellers, um, other firms that are complementary complementary to our firm. And can we team up with them to find opportunities? So the creative thinking, which is what adds a lot of the value in the beginning and, and really pushes us to think of things we might not have thought of before through those different combinations. And so we know that a lot of those aren't going to be deals that come out, but the idea is that we're pushing our thinking. And we want to find, if we're looking for $30 million, we want to find some chunky deals as well. So if we're finding things that are you know, $500,000 or uh, $300,000, we want to start finding chunks that are a million, two million, three million dollar chunks. We want to start pushing uh, beyond what we would normally look for. And that's going to start to unleash some ideas we wouldn't have had before. So that's a good place to start. Perfect. I'm getting real practical about this, knowing that most of the audience are B2B sales professionals. There's a whole bunch of sales managers and leaders are listening as well, but I tend to I tend to speak to them kind of around the houses through a conversation to B2B salespeople. If you, so just coincidentally, someone listening to the show now, Sam is listening to this show, Sam the salesman, and he his quota starts in a month's time. So perhaps he's hit quota already, he's a month ahead of himself, he's got a month to plan for the next 12 month period and say his goal is 10 million to keep that round number. Is this a sit down with management leadership and plan through it? Is this something that you sit on your own? You spend a weekend going through it? Is this something that you do once at the beginning of the year, plan it out perfectly and then don't think about it for 12 months until next uh, the, your next quota comes around? How do we implement this from a physical sitting behind a desk in a pen and paper perspective? You don't want to go it alone. I know some people have to because they work independently, but ultimately, you I mean, you really want to have a team that's working on this. So if I'm sales, the sales, say I'm the salesman, I am probably going to have other people, if I'm selling to large accounts, other people that may be working on those accounts as well, other account managers, other salespeople. So I probably want to pull those people in. Uh, if we're selling uh, technology products uh, or you know medical devices, I may want to pull specialists in who are uh, the SMEs, the subject matter experts that might be helping me. Uh, I probably want to pull in my manager at some point. Uh, and the idea behind that is that we're not doing this in isolation. We're doing this with a team because people are going to bring different perspectives in terms of how we're going to get to this objective. So uh, I think the way you should think about it is anybody that has a vested interest in that goal that you have should be in the room with you, helping you to plan that account or plan that goal. This doesn't have to be a long, laborious session. It really can be uh, what we think of as a brain trust. We get people together and we do some real brain work around that idea generation. So you don't want to go it alone. You don't want to do it one time either. So yes, you want to do it as you prepare for the start of the year. But I think one of the big pitfalls in account planning is people do exactly that. They do it once at the beginning of the year they put it away because I did the account planning. I met that requirement. Uh, I did the presentation of my bosses. They gave me the okay. I'm going to put that away and I'm going to go get on with business now. So, And then I don't <laughs> look at it until next year and I go, oh, that's interesting. You know, I said I was going to do uh, mm -hmm. these meetings with, with these executives and I never did that. And so it has to be a living process. So you want to be looking at it on a regular basis. Could be monthly, could be quarterly, depending on your sales cycle. But you want to have those check-in points. So the idea of process and making it a living process is extremely important uh, for a few reasons. One is that it keeps it top of mind and, and we're uh, remembering what we said we were going to do. Uh, number two, it makes it an accountability point. And you know, uh, Will, if you, if you tell somebody that you've got a goal and you're going to do certain things to accomplish that goal, 
just by telling them that or by documenting that, it makes it more likely that you're going to do it because they're going to have a checkpoint with you and you're going to say, well, did you do this? And you're going to go, oh, gosh, I've got to get ready and make that happen. So it builds accountability to have those checkpoints throughout the year. So you don't want to put it away. You want to make it a recurring living process. And just to double down that for a second before we drill into what account plans look like on paper or on a screen, should we be then, and this again might strike fear into some of the audience of getting the management and the, essentially the boss or um, key account people within the organization that they're trying to get into on board with this, should we be setting dates for this? Should there be not just, I'm going to close this account within the year. It's going to be, I'm going to speak to this person before this. We're going to strategize on this. We can have this meeting before then. Is that something that's going into these plans as well to increase accountability from all angles? Right. So the account plan cannot be high level and conceptual alone. It's great to have some conceptual high level thinking, but you have to boil that down to action plans. And those action plans should become literal dashboards. So if I say I've got a strategy to introduce a new product into this account and I need to meet with certain executives or it's probably not just me, I probably need to have my boss meet with some other executives as well because we're trying to hit multiple points, influence and buying points. If I have that action or that strategy, I have to have an action plan that's specific and has dates on it and it says who's going to do those things. And then we have to come back and we have to look at that and make sure that that it really happened. So that action plan really becomes the teeth for the accountability in the process, which really is what makes it work in the end. Perfect. So perhaps we'll come back onto the action plan and what that looks like, whether we're using software to track it, whether it's a, a document in a second. But we, again, Sam, the salesperson, they're, they're new to this. They have listed out all their accounts. They've listed out all the potential low-hanging fruit, which we should go after first. I think you mentioned earlier on. They've got two or three bigger deal sizes. They've got it up to, say, the, the 20 million mark, but we're aiming for 30 million to hit a target of 10. So we'll come on to the uh, other partners, different buyers, um, new products into the accounts, uh, increasing growth in the accounts in a second. But stick on new business just to keep it <laughs> somewhat simple and straightforward. What does a, a plan, uh, not a plan, what does, how, how, do, we, how do we confirm the amount that we think we can get out of an account? Is there some kind of analysis we can do on the account, whether it be their revenue, whether they've just had an influx of cash through um, venture capital or, you know, if we're dealing with startups, if they've just been funded, if the share price is great, if they've just got a new CEO, is there a way to get all this data, all these data points and put it into some kind of process that spits out, one, how easy it is to convert or get into an account, and then two, how much they're likely going to spend with us? Uh, the answer is it depends. And, and I think what the big dependency point is, is the industry that you're in. So some industries have really good information. If we're thinking about financial services, we're thinking about uh, selling uh, you know, mortgage insurance or mortgage services, we're thinking about selling uh, certain IT services, there is a lot of published data out there uh, so we know what the customers are buying. If we get into other types of services, we may have to go get that ourselves. So we may not know that. So you start looking for other indicators. Like you said, if a company got funding, if there's a major initiative that's happening. So if one of your customers has an initiative to you know, improve uh, their security processes uh, and we happen to sell security software, we know there's an opportunity there. So sometimes we have to estimate that um, ourselves. Uh, one of the best ways you can get information is by enlisting your customer in the account planning process. And, and I think uh, another one of the pitfalls in account planning is we tend to do it ourselves and it becomes an internal exercise. And if we can enlist our customers in the process in terms of coaching us and helping us to figure out some of these answers, that can give us information as well. And so in the best cases I see, we're getting the account plan to a certain point and we're sitting down with key customers and saying, okay, we want to accomplish something with you because the account plan is not about doing it to the customer. It's about doing it with the customer. There's some benefit to them or there should be uh, in us being successful. And if it's not, then if there's not a benefit, then we have to question whether we're a true partner to them. But my point is, if we're having conversations with the customer, we can also ask them about those things. What are your big priorities? Uh, what do you anticipate in, in terms of uh, uh, things that you're going to be doing next year in terms of projects. 
what might your spend be or uh, what might be, be the units that we could use to indicate what that spend might be. So we have to do some investigation work with the customer if that data is not you know, available publicly to us. So how much of this is down to experience and to, to make it accurate, because we can all guesstimate some of this, how much of it is down to experience versus some, and I think I know, I think I know where you'll go with this, versus some incredible mathematical formula or algorithm or software that we just throw all this in and it gives us some, uh, well, it gives us some security that we're going to hit target out the other side of it. How much of it is down to, you know, the accounts, you've got that business acronym, you can have intelligent conversations and ask great questions and get the correct feedback versus numbers in a spreadsheet. Well, uh, Stephen Hawking, who you, you know well, he uh, has said that he thinks there's an ultimate equation that predicts everything in the universe, but we haven't even found that for sales yet. So <laughs> I don't think we've found that equation. Uh, I think what we know is that it, it's really a, a bit of art and a bit of science. So the art is you do have to have experience. You do have to um, have knowledge about the account. You've got to be able to go in and do the investigation. Uh, the science is the methodology that you use behind this. So the science would be uh, understanding the uh, indicators of potential in the account. So, for example, if I am, uh, let's take a simple one, if I'm selling office products and office supplies, uh, there are indicators in an account which might be, say, number of white-collar workers in an account, which could tell me the potential demand for consumables, uh, office furniture, uh, machinery, so I can use indicators like that. Yeah, if I'm selling other types of products, and if we'll talk about medical products, which is uh, something that you, you sold before, if we're uh, selling to a hospital system, we know the number of beds, right? We have other indicators of, of potential. So there is a bit of science in that, uh, but then also the art is knowing how to apply that, knowing how to, where to ask the right questions, uh, knowing um, uh, uh, other, other indicators of potential, knowing how to uh, talk to the executives to get the right type of information from them. Is there a, a framework for someone who has never done this before? Perhaps they're new to the role. Perhaps they've just always sold by the seat of the pants. Uh, is there a framework such as uh, a SWOT analysis? Is there a framework, and there's probably a million other acronyms for the same kind of process of the strengths within the account, the weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and a number of other letters after the fact. Is there a framework that you would advise new people, not necessarily to sales, but new people to account management or account planning to to put in place just so that each account has has a comparable amount of data um, so you can go across them and, and real cherry pick where you want to be. Right, right. Uh, and there is. And I think when you ask most sales leaders, you ask most salespeople what an account plan looks like, everybody can rattle off the table of contents of an account plan. Uh, my whole point is make sure that it's comprehensive, make sure you've got the right components in it, make sure that it's specific enough uh, and not too high level, make sure that you're doing it uh, the same way across all of your accounts so that you can have those bases for comparison. So if I break it down into the pieces, the you mentioned SWOT analysis, that's really one of the first parts of the account plan, which is the profile and position. And we go into uh, all this in the book, Essential Account Planning. We go into the components, we go into the process, we go into uh, the different types of techniques you use. But if you think about the profile and position, that's going to include what's going on with the account right now. It's going to include what their priorities are for the coming year or coming years. It's going to include our position in the account. So that's your SWOT analysis. So where are our strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats? Uh, it's also going, going to include what the needs are uh, by buyer type or buyer uh, person uh, and, and level. So we really should know what they're trying to accomplish. So, and what what because I think that's important. I don't want to gloss over that, Mark. What does what does that look like physically on a piece of paper or on a screen? Is that um, the end decision maker is the CFO? This person's name. They want to achieve this in the next twelve months. The people we need to buy in to get the CFO on board is X, Y, Z, name what their goals are. Is that what we're looking to achieve or is that in too much detail? I, I think it's at two levels. The, the first level is in the uh, under, understanding the profile and the position for the account. The first level is what does that customer company want to achieve? Do they have big strategic priorities and what do the, the, the divisions or, or the business units need to achieve? And then when you get down to the next level, which is more specific, you get into what we think of as needs mapping and ali uh, alignments, 
what we're doing then is getting down to that detail. So then we're saying person by person uh, within the account, who lines up to that person? Or we think of it as facings. Who's the facing in our company to the person in their company? So with the president of their company, who should be facing off with that president? It may not be the salesperson. It may be the president of our company. Uh, but with the president of their company, with the vice president, with the head of engineering, whoever the buyers are, we need to understand what their particular needs are, what their particular priorities are. So I want to know what they buy, and I also want to know what they're trying to accomplish. And by doing that, we then know what we have to do in terms of our messaging to them. So we do have to get specific. Uh, what that looks like, basically, if you can uh, kind of envision it, uh, you would have, um, uh, you know, as almost as a spreadsheet, you would have the name of the buyer, you would have what their position is, you would have who the alignment point is, so who within our company aligns to them. Uh, you would understand what their top needs are or what, they're, what they need to accomplish to be successful. Uh, you would also understand what their level of purchase is and what they might buy as well. And then you would also have the actions or priorities that we have for that person uh, for, for each person in our account. So what we should be doing. So it, it does get very specific. And then that ultimately converts into that action plan. So you do have to get down to that level. People within accounts, as you know, will people within accounts are the ones that make decisions. The company doesn't make a decision. Usually it's people. So if we understand what they're looking for and we really are thoughtful about it, then it's going to make us a, a lot more successful in, in meeting their needs. I love this because inadvertently you've taken some of the pressure off the audience here. If you have this document, if you have someone, I've used the word uh, facing someone else, and you've got to get senior people in, you've got to get your product uh, specialists involved. If you've got them, for me, medical devices, I had product specialists, I had even logistics people that would then interface with the delivery and uh, biomedical engineering departments within the hospitals. If you can get all these people together, if you get them all on board with this document, it's not just putting you on the line of <laughs> here's the plan and my, my neck's out here in that I've got to do these tasks. And if I don't, I'm going to look like a fool at worst, uh, at, at best. I'm going to lose my job at worst. You're also rope, roping in everyone else to have the commitments as well. And I'm not saying that we're kind of sharing the blame here if, if it goes wrong, but it's an opportunity to get people on board, but bought in. And if you're doing this, and the rest of your team aren't, uh, and I use me medical devices as an example here, I think in my, so I was selling camera systems to the NHS with endoscopes and keyhole surgery equipment. I think there was 10 of us across the country. So the country, UK split up into 10 segments and there was one product specialist for each of the surgical disciplines for urology, for gynecology, for general surgery, um, and so on. So they would be, split across everyone uh, across the country. Luckily for me, the urologist lived kind of an hour away. Um, the gynecologist girl lived quite close as well. So they would be just on my patch because it was easier for them to visit my customers than it was anyone else's. Um, but if I had to put this plan into place, it was more detailed. There was names. There was, because I, I, I'm, I'm digesting this as we go through it. This is awesome. So one, you, you, if you get names, numbers, faces, times, dates, um, commitment points in a document like this, and you get everyone on board, you can almost then leave them to it to go about their day and, and speak to these individuals from a product specialist perspective. Because I know our product specialists would be at different conferences that I wouldn't be at. They'd be networking with different teams on totally different projects, and they'd interact with these individuals. If it was a theater manager, if it was a procurement team, they'd be doing all this in the background anyway. And if you have the best plan in your team, if you've got the easiest plan to follow, they're naturally going to work with you, aren't they? And they're naturally going to put you ahead of the rest of the team. And if you want to be slightly selfish for a moment, you're going to get the best results from that within the organization, right? Well, that's true. If you think about strategic account selling, it is a team sport. It is not an individual sport. And uh, if you think about, uh, I'm a big uh, fan of college basketball in the US. And there are four teams that consistently are at the top in terms of most uh, Final Four appearances in the NCAA, uh, most uh, tournament championships. Uh, one of those teams is UNC Chapel Hill, my alma mater. Well, Michael Jordan was a great player for UNC Chapel Hill, but he did not play it as an, as an individual. And uh, he played as a team. And there's a reason that team keeps showing up at the top year after year. 
Uh, it's not because of the players. It's not because of the coach. We've had uh, several coaches over the over the decades. It's because of the system. So there's a whole system that they they use, and that's why they're always at the top. And, and there there are a handful of teams like that. So if we're approaching it as a team sport, if we're approaching it as a system, and we're doing it in a planful way, then we're not going to be you know down by ten points with two minutes left in the game, which. Uh, you know, sadly happens a lot in sales. We're trying to pull rabbits out of hats and that, and that doesn't work. <laughs> and then you get into weird conversations. The desperation comes across, whether you're on the phone, whether you're in person, you perhaps make deals, you have conversations that you wouldn't have done otherwise. This is where you get into the word weird world of sales 20 years ago when influence and manipulation are kind of going next to each other because you want that holiday and you've got to get your target to, to get it. I think planning ahead allows you to make better decisions and allows you to be, um, you know, I don't think we need to dive into too much in the moral compass side of things, but I think it allows you to be happier about the work that you're doing. So we put all this together, Mark, everyone's agreed. Perhaps we've not got it in front of the customers. We've not taken action on this yet. And that's the next step. So we're going to do that for, uh, you know, week, two week, a month. How often do we need to revisit this document? Because I think your words were, it's a living document um, earlier on. How often do we need to revisit it? And do we need some kind of project management software? Is that dependent on the number of deals, the size and the number of people who are involved? Or, or can this be done through an email chain that goes out every kind of few weeks? Uh, I think in terms of the timing, the most common and, and probably the most successful is quarterly, quarterly updates. So we're doing the plan at the beginning of the year. We're having quarterly checkpoints. That also is a good point for us to be able to have uh, quarterly business reviews with our customer. So customers love QBRs. So if we can do that business review with them and they're actually part of the account plan, that, that syncs up nicely as well. Uh, software is important. I think the first software is probably the software in people's heads. It's people in terms of making sure that we have the right habits. So we need to put the habits in place in terms of being able to create an action plan that's visible to everyone. Uh, we need to ha put the habit in place in some organizations of having an account planning czar. So this is a person that may be over all the account planning process for the company that helps shepherd that through and make sure people are on track. If you don't have somebody in that role, then you, you, know, you end up doing that yourself, which is fine. So you have to have that discipline. The software, uh, yes, I, I think that does help. So the traditional account planning process is we put it all together in PowerPoint and it becomes this big laborious job. And then we get up and we do the presentation and it's, you know, it's, it's 50 slides or wherever we come up and it, it's way too much detail. And every time uh, the management team reviews the account plans, they're looking at a different format from every team. And so, so we're kind of stuck in the world of PowerPoint, but we want to get out of that. So if we can do something online in the cloud in terms of, and you can do this off of some of the CRM systems, if you can have an account planning, pro your account planning process online, uh, in your CRM system, then everybody's able to collaborate online to be, to see that. And one of the key components is, as I said, this action plan. So we can see, we can literally use that as a dashboard and see where we are and where we're tracking. And that, when we get to the, the quarterly business reviews, that's the piece that we should be looking at. We should be looking at what we said we were going to do and are we on track and do we need to make any course corrections as we're moving uh, through the game. Uh, so, uh, that that uh, software is a is a critical piece. Uh, I will also say you can't do it all virtually. So we have wonderful tools available in terms of uh, web conferencing and collaboration, uh, video collaboration software. There is a lot of value, uh, particularly if it's a large account, to get people in a room together and work on the initial planning. Uh, you get much more interaction. You get much more collaboration. It creates more pressure in terms of how we're going to find three times our goal, it creates more creativity. It also doesn't allow people to multitask, which they will do if, if you try to do it virtually. So again, best practice, the best one, best uh, companies I see, they will go to the, to the expense of getting everybody in a room at least once a year to do their initial planning. Makes total sense. You said something then and my ears pricked up, my eyes opened as you said it, and that is habits. What do we need to be doing each day as opposed to kind of monthly, quarterly, yearly? What do we need to be doing each day to make sure that we are focused on specific accounts and specific activities within accounts versus 
um, me getting medical device sales, getting calls from surgeons, asking to loan gear, calls from internally asking for stupid reports that they should be doing themselves. Uh, you know, the logistics guy saying he's broken down and the camera system that he's supposed to be delivering is not going to be there on time for this procedure. How do we, or what should, what, what are the habits we need to instill that we go through each day before we start dealing with all this crap that's labeled on, ladled on top of us as sales professionals? Well, I, I think uh, before we get to each day, I think what we have to do is think about how we're doing this. Uh, so you mentioned software. Software is a great enabler. The software really is a tool though. So uh, again, best practice that we see when we talk to executives and teams that are doing this well is they don't get, and this applies to day to day, you don't get hung up in the software you have to think and you have to problem solve and then let the software enable that or let the software help you to document that. So uh, I keep talking about pitfalls. Another pitfall is letting the tool take over. And this happens with CRM with our uh, uh, planning the pipeline on a regular basis as well. It becomes all about the CRM. Well, it's not, it's about problem solving. So we don't go through and we, you know, one of the daily habits is we don't go through and say, well, what's the probability of this particular deal closing and, and what's our, projected close date, you know, or days to close. Yeah, that's all BS anyway. People, people make that <laughs> stuff up, right? So well, this is one of my questions. Of, this is one of my questions. I'm, we'll come back onto habits in a second. I'll, I'll jot it down so I don't forget. Um, but you mentioned it now. Is there a way to predict when deals are going to close? Is it a, clearly it's not a useless metric, but I've never managed to do it. And the different CRMs I've used, it's uh, days, days left to close a deal, percentage of the deal closing, um, you know, opportunity within the account. Clearly, you can narrow these down as you get closer to that end moment. But if we're talking a year in advance, is, is there much value to these at all anyway? I don't know if anybody can predict when the deal is going to close. I think the people that want prediction are finance, uh, obviously sales. They want to know because that's how we do our, our financial planning. So we want dates, right? So we're forced to then make up dates. What we can affect, though, is we can affect the probability uh, by doing better problem solving, working with the right people, getting the right value proposition. And we can also affect urgency to some degree by knowing how to keep the process moving along, by being responsive, uh, by uh, getting to the answer as efficiently as possible, faster than our competitors. Now, you can't make a customer buy before they're ready to buy or make that decision before they're ready to make that decision. You can in some transactional environments, but in a major account environment, you really can't do that. So I, I think we can affect urgency to some degree, though. But I, I, I don't think we can be, I don't think we can nail dates. I think that's, you know, it's kind of like trying to, you know, uh, predict uh, stock prices. We just <laughs> have that kind of skill usually. Because I, I know my experience with this is, I'd set a date and then my sales manager would be ringing me two weeks before saying, how's it going? Are we nearly there? So I just put the date forward another three months and then forward another three months. And then the the date starts kind of 2017 and ends up 2021. And perhaps the business comes in and it's worth it, but it's difficult to judge that lead time. And what I'm getting from this conversation is it's important to plan to track all of this because it allows us to reduce the deal time, but perhaps we don't know that end point which is why we need the kind of free X on our on our total target. And I I interrupted you and derailed you there, Mark. Tell us more about the the habit side of things. And we need to shift the conversation a little bit as well. So in terms of habits, it's not the habit. The, the conversation is not how many days to close and what's our close date. The that's only the first piece. The other important habit is okay. Well, what can we do to advance this? What's the customer dealing with? Let's have a little brainstorming session to talk about possible ideas and angles and things that we can do maybe to, to help the customer out. We don't have enough of those creative problem solving conversations when we're looking at deal flow and we're looking at pipeline because we're doing it usually in desperation. We're doing it to try to meet some requirement. <laughs> And the requirement should be about the customer. So let's, and, and, and I see this over and over. If we, you know, if you and I sit down and we start talking about the deal, sometimes we'll come up with stuff that I wouldn't have thought of myself and we'll engage other people that I might not have reached out to. And then things start to happen. And well, what about this partner? Or, you know, there's a guy we know in the account that maybe could give us some more information. So it's the create the creative piece that, that that's really uh, important. So that that's one uh, habit. I think another one is accountability. 
And this goes for the leader of the account team, and it also goes for the sales leader, which is demanding accountability. Uh, with account planning, too often, as I said before, what happens is we do the plan, we put it away, we pick it up again next year. The accountability says you have an account plan, you have a strategy, you have an action plan, and we are going to hold you accountable for uh, hitting those those milestones, for hitting those goals. It's not acceptable to just say, oh, well, that didn't work out. You're, you need to hit those those milestones. And doing those right type of activities does uh, result in performance. So uh, a lack of accountability is, is a big issue. And that runs all the way to the top in a lot of sales organizations where the account planning is not a major priority. It's a, it's a rote exercise that people go through. So the account planning strategy has to be part of the sales strategy. And usually the chief sales officer is the one that's got to make that mandate and say, here's where it fits in. And here's why it's important. And here's why it's unacceptable not to do it. And here's why we want to do it, because it's going to make you successful. Uh, and, and I'll bring up one other habit, Will, which is uh, motivation. So people don't want to do this. You know, as we said before, people would rather be out selling. The motivational piece is in terms of incentive. So there should be, uh, people should understand how their work and account planning lines up to their incentive program or the results of their incentive program, their commission program. So I'm actually going to get paid more if I do this. Uh, it also uh, aligns to uh, affirmation and reward. So when people are doing the right things, no, you don't get paid for everything that you do well, but you know, we got that meeting, we built that relationship. There should be accolades. There should be, people should be recognized for that. So we have to have recognition around people accomplishing things within the account plan. And then regarding habits and also incentive, it's not just about the incentive that you're going to earn this year. It's about the incentive that you could earn and what it could do for your life and for your family next year, over the next three years and the next five years. And as salespeople, we don't think long term. We're thinking a couple of weeks ahead. So there's this idea of being aspirational. So when I'm doing account planning, I should not be doing it just for next year. I should be doing it looking out over the next three or five years. And that allows me to set a bigger goal. So the, you know, the big audacious, hairy goal thing is we want to be able to set a goal and say, well, how big could this account be? Could it be 30 million? Could it be $50 million? And then if we put a time frame on that and we say, well, is that in three years? Is that in five years? If you put a goal down and you put a time frame down, you cre create a trajectory or a path to get there. And then we know what we have to do uh, along the way. And that also change our, changes our positioning with the customer. So when we say with the customer, you know, we'd like to be a $40 million partner with you. Well, if they don't see us that way, the first thing they do is they go, really? Then they step back and then they say, well, how are we going to do that? And we start having the question about how. So, um, so the, the habit of being aspirational, but also knowing how it connects to the, the betterment of your life. So what does it look like for our team when we're actually at a $40 million level with this account? What's that going to do in terms of our earnings and what we can do for our families? So there's a lot of emotion you can get into this thing as well to get people uh, enlisted in, in your plan. Uh, by what it can do for them in their lives. So, you know, it's, it goes beyond the form, filling out the forms. It makes total sense. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if I've ever done this on the show, but I'm actually quite inspired, Mark. I've got a product launch, which is going to take me from now till Christmas. But I've got relationships with the companies that we work with, especially the big boys, the Salesforce, the HubSpots, LinkedIn's that we worked with. I've got relationships there where I could probably sit down, even just fly out and go and see them if we're if I'm going to be increasing deal size and talking strategically about a whole account with them, I could probably fly out, have a sit down with the, the people that I work with there at each of these individual companies and ask them that question of how do we go from six figures that we're working together or, you know, to kind of quarter of a million, half a million or whatever it is. Cause we, I know we can offer that value and there's definitely strategic ways that we could implement that. And, and, you know, that kind of number is, four, five, six CRM setups that come through our kind of user base, which is happening as it is. I know <laughs> I know the kind of revenue that Salesforce in particular are driving through us. And there seems like plenty of opportunities to do that. So you've inspired me here of, I might sit down, make a, a plan, put it in front of the audience, perhaps don't include company names or do include company names. I don't know. It'd have to be somewhat strategic about that. But then do it as a case study of, here's my goals, here's what I'm aspiring to do, 
over one year for sure. And then five years, the revenue that we want to bring in through the ad sales, through the lead gen that we do, through the, the podcast audience and the email list and all this kind of stuff. And make it somewhat public so they can follow along and they can keep me accountable to some of this as well. And they can enjoy in the successes and they can enjoy kicking my ass when I don't follow through on things. So I'm intrigued. I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a genuine think about this over the week think about this over the weekend and see there's there's magic in thinking big. And and I think that's one of the big findings we have in the book is that the account plan is not about filling out forms. It's not about getting the exercise done. It's about thinking big. And and you've got to put those big numbers out there. Um, you know, also, well, as we said before, if you can get other thought partners that help you go through that, uh, they can help push your thinking as well. But that that should be one of the questions everybody asks. Am I thinking big enough here or am I just getting by with what's been asked uh, of me? Makes total sense. With that, Mark, uh, I'm going to have to wrap things up here because we could talk about this all day, mate. Because <laughs> I'm pulling, I'm pulling information and, and knowledge for myself, which hopefully is translating for the audience. But I've got one final question to ask everyone that comes on the show, and that is: if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? I love that. I love that. Uh, I I think it would be, uh, don't be so nervous and know that things are going to work out, and 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 enjoy the process. And I think a lot of times for type A people, we tend to push so hard that we don't enjoy the ride. And uh, uh, if I could tell my younger self that, just enjoy it and, and really uh, get yourself engaged in it, I, I think I would do that. Makes total sense. With that, you've hinted at the book. Tell us more about it, where we can find it, and then where we can find more about you as well, Mark. Great. Uh, well, the book is called Essential Account Planning. Uh, it is available on Amazon. And it goes into interviews uh, with, with sales executives, uh, stories, uh, tools, process. It's got some workbook components, so it's a very usable guide. Uh, you can also uh, learn more about us at salesglobe.com. You can find our, our blogs out there as well. And then uh, depending on your interest, we have a couple of other books called The Innovative Sale, which is about creative problem solving for sales, kind of left brain and right brain thinking. And then what your CEO needs to know about sales compensation. Uh, which is about connecting the strategy to the front line through incentives. And those are all available on Amazon. Fantastic. Well, I will link to all of them in the show notes of this episode over at salesmanpodcast.com. And thank you, Mark, for obviously your, the intelligent conversation you've had with us. Kind of, It's me throwing ridiculous questions at you and you pinging back useful answers. I appreciate that, mate. And the fact that I genuinely feel inspired to put something together for this, to document it, to share it with the audience. So they can, they can see what's going right, what's going wrong. I think that's the accountability element of this could be really useful. So I appreciate that. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you, Will. 